So hello everyone and welcome to today's public information meeting on wildfires in the Thompson Nicola Regional District. My name is Michelle Nordstrom and I am the information officer with the TNRD's Emergency Operations Center in Kamloops. Before we get started, I would just like to take a moment and acknowledge that we connect with many First Nations communities across our vast regional district and today are located on the Tecumseh to Shikwetmink territory situated within the unceded lands of the Shikwetmink Nation. The TNRD appreciates the partnership that we have and respect the territory and land on which we are meeting from today. A recorded version of this meeting will be available to stream on demand uh, on our website, that's at tnrd.ca and on our YouTube channel. All attendees joining us today will be asked to or will be muted to allow for our presenters to speak on the current wildfire situation in the region. Uh, there will be no live question and answer period at today's meeting, uh, but attendees are always welcome to submit questions in advance, and we will address those questions that we've received today. So today we'll be getting an update from the BC Wildfire Service on uh, several of the wildfires in the region. Um, I believe to start, we will be hearing from uh, Luke Robinson on the Sparks Lake Wildfire Complex. Yeah, good afternoon. Hi, Luke. No problem. Um, so Sparks Lake Complex uh, involves currently three uh, fires on the BCWS uh, website, being Sparks Lake uh, in the north, Embleton Mountain, and the Tremont Creek fire. Embleton Mountain uh, is currently contained and is being patrolled twice daily uh, in that area. And is currently, um, we're looking at bringing it under control in the coming days. Uh, Sparks Lake, uh, we've seen some growth in the north, northeast and northwest um, components, uh, but we've had uh, some good news in the last 24 hours with the lifting of orders and downgrading of them to alert through the more the centre of the fire up the tranquil Chris Creek Road and the Deadman Vedette Road up to Vedette, uh, which has seen um, a large amount of community members be able to get back to their residences and uh, properties in that area. Uh, we're currently working with heavy machinery uh, and helicopters as well as firefighters along that northwest and northeast uh, to ensure guards are put in place uh, during this window of opportunity with the weather and some planned ignitions uh, will be occurring in the coming days uh, to strengthen those containment lines. Uh, Tremont Creek fire, uh, as per the last update, it is on Mount Savannah and is currently working its way down the northern aspect of Mount Savannah towards the uh, town of Savannah. Uh, currently, it is at a very slow rate of spread uh, backing down the hill. And we are currently working on guards uh, to the north, east and the west of Mount Savannah uh, with planned ignitions, uh, most likely night ignitions occurring uh, in the coming days when a uh, window of opportunity arises uh, with the weather and the moisture. Uh, we had rain over all three fire grounds last night. Uh, it included some lightning, but we have found no new starts in the area and the fire conditions are quite benign today on these three fires. Uh, that's it for me. Great. Thanks very much, Luke. Uh, next, I think we will be um, hearing about the White Rock Lake Wildfire Complex from Forest Towers. Uh, Forest, do we have you with us? Yes, actually. Yes, you bet. Forest Tower here. Um, and as mentioned, I will be giving an update on the White Rock Lake Wildfire. So, F O R R E S T T O W E R is the spelling. I saw someone in the chat just asking for that. Uh, I'm actually going to share my screen and um, just to go over the perimeter a little bit because it's a very large fire. So, um, I will start kind of on the furthest west uh, flank of the fire. Um, and I will try and annotate as I'm uh, talking about the fire here. So uh, currently we have um, pretty good guard and containment along the western flank, uh, kind of in this, I guess this is gonna be a green color here. So all along down into this area along this perimeter, uh, the current weather conditions have allowed us to get uh, pretty far ahead in terms of our 
uh, objectives and control objectives. So currently there's machine guard um, going in along almost the entire southern perimeter. Um, uh, and so they're able to uh, do that pretty efficiently with uh, the diminished fire behavior. And so kind of the, the green areas here are um, at this time showing uh, kind of minimal fire activity still rank one to rank two everywhere within this fire. So that's gonna be, there is some surface fire, um, it's still smoking. Uh, and so we do have some pockets of rank, uh, rank two to rank three, which means that there's going to be visible flame. Uh, there might be some understory burning, but it's not at the point at this time, and the, or at least for now, it is not at the point where there isn't any candling or sort of crown uh, fire in any of the uh, areas across the White Rock Lake wildfire. There was uh, various, uh, amounts of precipitation around most of the fire as uh, I think it is in most of this region. And so uh, the most that we received was around two and a half millimeters, which is enough to diminish fire behavior in the short term. So kind of yesterday, today, going into probably Monday, Tuesday, uh, next week, we'll see some lower fire behavior. But with the expected ridge to start building on Monday, uh, we're, we're kind of seeing some higher temperatures forecast. Uh, and so probably by the end of next week, uh, Thursday, Friday-ish, we will be back to pretty um, aggressive fire behavior, or at least the possibility for that. And again, uh, mainly these fires have been, uh, in terms of growth and spread, predominantly influenced by wind direction and wind speed. Fuels are extremely dry no matter where you are in the southern part of the uh, province. And so this amount of rain, again, a little bit of diminished fire behavior, but going into the uh, into the week, we're, we're going to reach right back at it. So I'll keep moving around uh, the fire here. And so um, I'll try and move this a bit so it's easy to see. And let's see if I can erase this line. There we go. So moving more into kind of the eastern and southeastern flank, so this bottom southern flank, um, kind of around this area. This is currently where we're um, trying to put uh, machine guard a little bit south, south of the uh, of the current perimeter. Um, however, with the lower fire behavior, we're actually doing some direct attack. And so um, the wildfire crews that are in this area are kind of trying to tight line where possible to prevent any further spread south uh, on this flank. This is a little bit less contained uh, than, than the more Western area. Um, and so they're, really trying to get ahead again in this window of opportunity um, that we have for this uh, current period of weather. Uh, and then uh, probably one of our top areas right now at this point is uh, the fire flank in and around the West Side Road area. So West Side Road kind of for those uh, who are familiar is gonna run along kind of the West Bank of the Okanagan Lake. And so you can see currently um, right in here where my green line is going, this, second line, it is encroaching upon properties on the west side of the Okanagan Lake. So we do have a lot of structure protection uh, engines and personnel in there. They are primarily working on structure protection, obviously, in terms of setup on structures, but also engaging in some firefighting uh, in and around those structures. And we also do have a unit crew and uh, some single resources um, supported by uh, the structure protection personnel. And they are working up on uh, this area here, so kind of on the top right of that, uh, that furthest eastern flank, and really primarily focused on trying to stop further spread north and northeast on this flank. So there is some some active wildfire in and around uh, that eastern flank in the West Side Road area, and uh, we are doing what we can there. Again, using this window of opportunity to do some more direct attack. So they're actually putting the fire out or attempting to instead of building guard away from the fire. And so as long as we can have those safe conditions, we'll continue to do so. Uh, structure protection is also requested and uh, should be either here or incoming, a specialized off-road uh, structural protection vehicle. So that will be able to kind of leave the, the main road and, and drive in behind those properties. And uh, it's been sort of described as a large initial attack truck, so it has water hoses, that kind of stuff, and can actually um, put a lot of water uh, into the fire behind those properties um, that are a bit inaccessible to traditional structural fire engines. So moving on up uh, kind of into the um, entire northeastern flank. So um, at this point, once the map loads here, um, but basically from visual or uh, verbal description from Monty Lake all the way down into the further east uh, perimeter by Okanagan Lake, that is showing some, some decent fire activity. 
uh, rank two, rank three, like I was describing earlier. So um, it's now loaded in here from me, hopefully for everyone else. So around this three line here, that's currently in these kind of two fingers is where we're seeing some, uh, the most activity that we are seeing anywhere on the fire is currently in that area. And so crews are again, working to tie in uh, roads, cut blocks, existing natural features, they're building guard ahead of the fire there. And then um, using sort of uh, this window of opportunity to be a bit more aggressive in their, uh, in their lines than previously. It's obviously been a very aggressive fire. And so we've had to tactically withdraw a few times um, just to keep everyone safe. It's obviously our top priority is uh, our first responders above everything else. So we need to make sure it's safe for them to be operating in those areas where they are operating. So finally up and I'll try and drag it. Hopefully it doesn't unload. So up into kind of the finger that's around the Monty Lake area. Um, once it loads in, we can kind of see where, uh, where it extends to. We haven't had any significant growth in this area um, or really anywhere on the fire, but particularly of concern of it going kind of further northeast or north. So crews are working on both sides, basically um, using existing roads and tying into the highway and also along this side as well. They are currently at the point where they have um, so far been able to put in guard that has held over the last few days. So we haven't had any challenging um, any challenging fire behavior. Again, we're going to see that in the next week upcoming with uh, heightened weather. But as of right now, things are looking um, like they're holding in, in this area. And so crews are actually getting up and around the horn here. And so that's kind of one a, a main focus right now is, is to use handline machine guards supported by helicopters. Uh, we had air tankers working in here on the 6th. And so it, it's another priority to make sure that this fire doesn't spread any more north or northeast. Uh, and so same likewise along the actual top of this northern uh, flank. Again, same, same idea as just putting guard ahead of the fire and uh, where possible using small scale hand ignition to remove fuel uh, between the guard and the fire's perimeter. It's proved successful on this fire and other fires uh, within the province. And just given the volatile fire behavior, um, it's often one of the only uh, viable objectives is to kind of get a guard in and then remove those fuels before the fire can spot over the guard. Um, we were seeing spotting up to a kilometer and a kilometer half ahead of this fire, um, sort of when that alert was recommended to go in for Vernon, um, was one of the main concerns was that it would spot over Okanagan Lake. Uh, luckily, we were able to uh, get a break in the weather and, and that didn't happen, but this fire is showing a very, very extreme fire behavior. And so um, just again, I'll say it again, we are expecting at some point to be returning to that uh, conditions that will lead to that significant fire behavior. And uh, the only other thing, as I mentioned, we'd have the skimmer group working yesterday uh, along the West Side Road area. So they're basically just pulling water from Okanagan Lake and, and cooling down conditions uh, in and around properties uh, on that West Side Road. And again, just supporting crews as they're putting that guard in. So um, in terms of resources and all those other specifics, um, the Wildfire of Note page will be the best um, source of information. So continue to check that. Uh, I will be here for the next uh, 12-ish days and so um, in terms of updates for the wildfire of note for sure in the morning and then I have a meeting at 1 where I get an update and I have a meeting at 7 p.m where I get another update so that's normally the frequency uh, of updates is at least two times a day I try and get updates on um, more often if needed but for sure that's uh, the kind of cycle that you can expect for that wildfire of note page and I will leave it at that for the rest of my colleagues to give their updates thank you Great, thank you so much for that update, Forrest. And uh, to a few of our attendees who were requesting our, uh, our, our panelists to mute, uh, the background noise that you heard was actually uh, in the background of where Forrest is working out of our Kamloops Fire Center. Uh, so uh, please be advised that uh, sometimes uh, our presenters are coming on, they are actively working, there are staff working hard behind the scenes and we might get a little bit of uh, uh, distracting audio in the background, but such is the nature of, uh, of the work that everybody is out there doing. And we appreciate everyone as always uh, from BC Wildfire taking the time out of their days to join us and uh, provide this update to, to our public who are joining us today as well. So thanks very much for that forest. Obviously a lot of um, activity happening around the White Rock Lake Wildfire uh, and a number of different agencies and uh, uh, things uh, involved uh, with that there. So we'll, we'll look forward to the next update on that. Uh, so I think we're going to be hearing next um, about the Lytton Complex fire um, and John uh, Stoser, are you here with us today?
Hello. Yes, Hello. I'm here. Okay. Great, you can hear me. Um, thank you for having me. I'll uh, give an update on the Litton complex of wildfires. Uh, so we have four wildfires in the complex right now. We have the 1030, uh, the McKay Creek Fire, 1086, the Litton Creek Fire, uh, the 804 George Road Fire, and uh, the V1669 uh, Fire, which is um, just a little farther south and uh, in the coastal fire center. Uh, but this incident management team is managing that fire. So I will start up with the Litton Creek Fire um, and just some, some weather uh, from across the complex that we received over the past 24 hours or so. Um, it's been scattered precipitation. Uh, the far north, uh, the McKay Creek Fire received approximately 20 milliliters of, uh, mil milliliters of precipitation on the fire. And um, that was probably the most precipitation that we've noted on our uh, weather stations. The other three fires um, received about five. So uh, a bit of ranging, uh, but um, I think the story there is that the precipitation is enough to reduce fire behavior on the McKay Creek fire. Um, if the forecast holds for a couple days, uh, we're gonna see hot, dry temperatures um, coming back. And with that will be some increased fire behavior. Um, it'll probably take maybe an extra day to see that um, the fire behavior increase on the uh, 1030 fire and the other three fires, Lytton, George Road, and Mohawkam. We're expecting to see um, some increased fire behavior uh, starting in another day or two. Uh, but for yesterday and today, we saw reduced fire behavior over the past uh, few days before that. Uh, the Lytton Creek fire is still considered out of control and it's about 51,700 hectares in size right now. There's 83 firefighters, 36 pieces of heavy equipment, and we have about 13 different helicopters across our complex that are deployed as needed to um, various priority areas within the complex uh, and our incident management team. Uh, we also have uh, approximately 30 structure protection personnel on fires within the complex. So, uh, yeah, today we're expecting low fire behavior on the Litton Creek fire. Uh, the main hot spots on that fire have been to the northwest um, in the Botany Mountain area and to the east, southeast um, in the Shacken area. Um, and so it's been about two days of lower intensity fire, which has allowed our crews and equipment to do some good work, um, working on some mop-up. So on the east side of the Litton fire, we've had crews working to um, conduct ignitions, hand ignitions in that shack and area. There's a very strong um, fire guard in place there along an existing right of way underneath the power line that ties into the highway and um, the crews are removing fuel um, to remove fuel in between that guard and the flank of the fire to protect the town of Shack and, and areas to the south. There's another contingency line uh, along the Manning Creek Forest Service Road um, and that road has been uh, had vegetation removed on either side of it. It's been um, daylighted on either side so that's a good contingency line for us as well. Uh, we've had quite a bit of uh, helicopter bucketing in that kind of southeast corner to support the crews on the ground and the heavy equipment as they've constructed those fire guards and continue to do hand ignitions in that area. And they'll continue to look for opportunities to do that. Um, the kind of times of the day to remove that fuel has actually been later in the day uh, into the evenings and night. Um, and so, will continue to assess. Uh, structure protection crews have been deployed uh, within these areas um, in Shacken and set up structure protection assets. Uh, they're, out, they're testing those as well, making sure that they're functioning as they should. Um, and they've also assessed uh, communities further south of there 
community of Noahich. Um, there's also been um, monitoring in the Spences Bridge, uh, Cooks Ferry Indian Band, and Nicola Valley areas for hotspots, and those are mopped up as required. Um, to the west side of this fire, uh, kind of in the northwest along Highway 12, um, smoke has been quite visible in this area, and uh, especially over the last few days, there was some very strong winds, uh, but the fire has stayed within well-contained lines. Um, so that's been good in that area. Uh, the incident management team did recommend a uh, small evacuation order for some properties in that area. Uh, and we'll continue to assess the need for those type of recommendations uh, based on the weather and fire conditions going forward. Um, there is a strong uh, fire guard in that area, the Lalibison Forest Service Street Road as well, which is just north of kind of where the fire activity is. Um, and yeah, vegetation has been removed from either side of that road. So there's been some really good work done in that area quite uh, quite quickly. Um, we do have crews on the east side of the Botany Valley uh, that have set up structure protection uh, equipment and uh, that equipment is uh, being tested frequently as well and structure protection is being assessed and will be established in the Turnip Lake area a little farther north if it's required. Uh, so moving to the K Creek fire the size of the fire is approximately 32,000 hectares, 32,600, and the fire is considered out of control. Uh, as of today, we have 26 firefighters up there. Uh, some helicopter activity and some heavy equipment is still in place. Uh, this was the fire that received the most precipitation. Um, and so we're expecting low fire behavior today and uh, likely tomorrow as well. And as the warm and dry temperatures come back though, we're expecting an increase in, fi in fire behavior very soon. Um, but this does give us some opportunities to continue mopping up some hot spots that were in the Lee Creek area, which is the south of the fire perimeter. Um, we've also had aerial reconnaissance in the area um, to prepare containment lines uh, for some future uh, possible operations that can be undertaken in the Apple Springs area. Um, there's a, a bit of a pre-developed guard around some communities. So we have some equipment moving into that area to strengthen those pre-established fire guards, uh, structure protection as well, some areas down there. Um, and the West Pavilion Road area, uh, there's hand guard being um, established to tie into roads and natural features in that area uh, with the objective of preventing fire spreading to the south. The George Road fire, uh, which is south of the Lytton 1086 fire, is still considered out of control. The size of that fire is 1,448 hectares. Uh, we have some helicopter resources in place there today. And it received about five milliliters of precipitation um, overnight. And again, low fire behavior there today is expected. However, five uh, mils is not that much. And so um, it'll dry out quickly. So this wildfire was classified as a full response now. And it's in proximity of the Scuppa Indian Reserve number one. Um, fire activity on the corner near this community has been lower over the past several days and uh, our team has been keeping it up into high points with helicopter bucketing. Uh, heavy equipment is deployed to the wildfire in this area today as well uh, to begin establishing fire guards uh, and structure protection spe specialists have completed their assessments of the area. Uh, they'll be deploying structure protection equipment as needed. And the final fire in the complex is the Mohawkam Creek wildfire. The Mohawkam Creek wildfire um, is now a wildfire of note on the BC 
wildfire services um, dashboard and fires of note page. So we'll pro be providing updates on this fire um, uh, daily, uh, if not more frequently than that. Um, so again, five mils of precipitation on that fire. Low fire behavior is expected today on site. And we will have structure protection personnel in the Kanaka Bar area developing structure protection plans and deploying equipment as needed. Heavy equipment's also heading into this area to be uh, to begin preparing for guard construction. There are some uh, four service roads along the Mohawk and Creek area where we can uh, remove some vegetation to create some stronger fire guards. And we've had heavy helicopters working in the area uh, the past few days on the southwest corner of the fire to reduce further fire activity in that section. Um, so during hot and dry conditions, a number of these fires are quite visible from travel corridors. Uh, so something to consider is uh, traveling along Highway 99, Highway 1, um, Highway 12, uh, that these will be visible during hot, dry conditions. Once the weather picks back up again, uh, smoke will be visible from those areas. Um, and especially around Highway 99, we've had reports of people stopping to look at the fire. Um, and we do ask that if people are stopping, that they drive with caution uh, at all times in these areas. And if they're stopping to watch where they stop their vehicles and um, make sure they stay away from areas of dried vegetation um, and to consider driving to uh, keep uh, safe conditions in the travel corridors of the area. Um, that is all for today. Thank you. Thanks for your update, John. Uh, next, we will be hearing from um, Jean Strong in our uh, Kamloops Fire Center today to give a bit of a brief update on the July Mountain uh, wildfire. And anything else you have for us today, Jean? Good afternoon. Uh, the July Mountain wildfire has seen quite a bit of precipitation over the last few days. The night before last, we saw four hours of rain on that fire, and my understanding is that there was a, a, some more hours of rain on it last night. We are continuing to work on building guards, and we also have aerial resources supporting crews in that area. It does continue to be uh, quite a sight to see from the Coquihalla and a bit of a visual distraction for drivers in the area, but the road has been assessed by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and deemed as safe. I would recommend travelers uh, travel with caution on the Coquihalla and, and make sure you check Drive BC before your trip. And then Michelle, did you would you like me to answer that question now or at the end? Um, let's see, I think we might have, did we have somebody from Caribou Fire Center to give an update as well? I believe we do today. It looks um, like it. Okay, yeah, maybe we'll go over to Car uh, Caribou, hear a bit of an update from them, and then we have one question from our public submissions for BC Wildfire that we can come back and have Jean uh, answer for us. So Perfect. thanks for that, Jean. So next we will hear from uh, Caribou Fire Center uh, on any updates they have for us today. Thank you. My name is Jessica Mack, and I'm the information officer for the Caribou Fire Center. And so right now we have 42 active wildfires within our center. 14 of those are within our central caribou zone. We have 10 within our Quinell fire zone and six within our Chilcotin, and then 13 within our 100 mile zone, which is where the um, TNRD would reside in. So right now, our fire danger rating is mostly moderate with areas of high and small pockets of extreme. Um, we have had some cooler temperatures and some precipitation within our center over the last couple of days. But as everyone else has mentioned, we are anticipating some warmer and drier conditions and do expect fire activity to increase. So for the Young Lake fire, the size has not increased um, in the last couple um, of days, it remains at 6,937 hectares in size. All activity remains within containment lines, and you may see um, some smoke um, within the perimeter, but that's just burning unburnt fuels, and it has not crossed any of our containment lines um, as of yet. So heavy equipment has completed a uh, containment line um, with it 
that goes into the Sparks Lake fire that was completed yesterday. So firefighters are continuing with mop up operations um, and establishing a 20 foot black line and wet line along the eastern flank of the fire. Helicopters continue to be on site of that fire and supporting with any um, suppression efforts um, by putting buckets of water onto to hot spots when they're required to. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great, thanks for the update, Jessica. Much appreciated. So finally, we uh, I believe that is all of the attendees from uh, BC Wildfire uh, we had on our agenda to hear from today. We did have one question from the public that Jean will answer for us. So I just wanted to say uh, to all of our um, presenters from BC Wildfire Service, uh, usually uh, we kind of get an update from them and then we, we let them get back to, to uh, doing their jobs and uh, uh, working on fighting these fires. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us again today. Uh, we always appreciate hearing the update and providing this to the public in the regional district. So um, we'll, uh, we'll be hearing from you again in a few days. So thank you very much and um, uh, take care uh, out there. And we will be uh, hearing from you soon. And then I'll just keep Jean on with us um, or anyone else who might be sticking around from wildfire. So uh, Jean, yes, um, did you want to read and respond to the uh, question that we had received um, on the submission form on the TNRD's public, uh, the website. Sorry, would you like me to read it? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, maybe. I, do you have it in front of you or I'm happy yeah. to? Yeah, I do Great. have it in front okay. of you. Give me one second. Perfect. Um, so we Thank had a question. Oh, I will, uh, I'll kind of give the Sparks notes, um, but it was a question from Patty regarding the ignition of the White Rock Lake fire and, uh, reading online that local farmers and ranchers have been told to stand down and not put out this fire when it was reported um, and concerns about the leadership in that decision. So I do have some details about when that fire was first reported in our initial response. So the first report of that fire on July 13th was made around 4 p.m. and we had an initial attack crew on scene within 30 minutes. When the crews arrived on scene, that fire was burning rank four, which is quite aggressively in a heavy timbered area and already 10 hectares in size, as I believe Forrest mentioned. By the next day, the fire had grown to 300 hectares, so it was certainly moving very quickly. Crews were pulled off at initial response on the 13th to tactically evacuate properties in the area because of the aggressive behavior the fire was exhibiting to both life and property, or it was a threat to both life and property. Uh, although Tolko, as well as partners from the Douglas Lake Ranch, were both in response, they were working on building guard right off the bat alongside BC Wildfire Service crews. We also had air support in the form of helicopters with a thousand liter capacity responding to the crew or to the fire on the 13th. A request was put in for air tanker response, but due to the intensity of the fire and how quickly it was growing, it was beyond air tanker resources or capacity because it was spotting it so far ahead. And then due to those conditions on that fire, as well as the heightened activity throughout the fire center, we were in the heat wave. We were already responding to a number of significant fires. For example, the July mountain fire, which I mentioned in my update earlier, was discovered on the same day. And other fires were also a direct threat to home and infrastructure. So we were prioritizing our responses, but still had those resources there that day on July 13th after the initial report. I hope that addresses your question. Um, if you have any further questions, feel free to give us a call at the Kamloops Fire Center. Thanks very much for answering that one, Jean. We appreciate it. Um, and that was the only question we had received directly for BC Wildfire today. I do have a few public questions for the Thompson Nicola Regional District that I will be answering as well. Um, so uh, again, um, our BC Wildfire Services staff uh, will probably be signing off uh, so they can, uh, they can get back to work. So uh, we appreciate uh, hearing from you and uh, our public as well. So thanks for your updates today and we will uh, see you on the next um, public update information meeting. So with that, um, I will uh, answer the few questions that I have received on the Thompson Nicola Regional District website for the Thompson, for the TNRD in um, regards to uh, a few different uh, um, 
uh, fires and, and situations that people have been inquiring about. And then I'll just give a bit of an update on the current evacuation orders and alerts uh, that are active throughout the region and share the dashboard of the map so that you can all uh, kind of get a visual of, of what that looks like. So the first question uh, that I'll address, uh, again, these are questions submitted by public. So if you're here with us today and you have a question, um, if it's urgent, if you need to speak with somebody, please contact us directly here at the Emergency Operations Center. We are here uh, Monday, well, seven days a week, actually. We're here, obviously, it's Sunday today. So we're here seven days a week. We continue to have a full-scale activation here. Um, we're happy to, uh, to take your call. Um, we're here from about 8.30 a.m. through 8 p.m. Uh, oftentimes, it has been uh, later than that. So um, if you do have any questions, you can call us right now. Uh, somebody would be happy to speak with you. It's uh, one. Uh, let me just make sure I provide you with the right number. We have a toll-free number if you are within uh, BC, but a little bit further away from Kamloops, you can call us toll-free um, at one eight seven or sorry one eight six six three seven 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 one eight eight, or you can uh, call us uh, just on the regular line is two five zero three seven 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 one eight eight. Uh, so we'd be happy to hear from you, or if you'd like us to address your question at the next um, live update meeting, as this one, uh, there's a submission form on our website um, where um, if, you, if you visit our website, we have an emergency services page and a 2021 wildfire information um, uh, page that you can click on. You'll see the recordings of all of the previous wildfire update meetings and a submission form area uh, where you can send us your questions and we will address them. You can submit them to us at the TNRD or BC Wildfire or other agencies. And sometimes at our meetings, we'll invite other agencies to speak and address those questions that come in. So the first question for the TNRD that we received is regarding inspection on properties that have fire damage. Um, they're sort of looking for information about who does the assessment and uh, copies of the assessment and that sort of thing. Um, so I'll sort of generally speak to um, the assessment process. Um, and um, we, well, we, we have a few areas in the uh, region that um, there has been some property damage and, and dis destruction that has occurred. When that happens, uh, as an organization, we, we aim to get in and do a rapid damage assessment uh, as soon as we can. So basically an on the ground and or aerial view of, uh, of uh, properties that are within the Thompson Nickel Regional District so that we can then identify the property and the address and then attempt to contact the owner of the property to uh, discuss uh, the damage. And we will often share uh, photos or images of, of, of the damage so that we can uh, verify that with the owner and, and talk through um, what that looks like in terms of, of the extent of damage. Um, so it, it will vary depending on where uh, this person has written in from. Um, we also have a number of fires that are sort of crossing over jurisdictional boundaries. They may be into uh, a municipality or a First Nation or uh, potentially another regional district. So um, what I would recommend uh, you do is to contact our emergency operations center or depending on where you look, you're located, contacting your local government um, just to sort of make sure that you're, you're talking to uh, to uh, the, the correct agency who's going to be doing that assessment on your property. Um, so that's, that's our goal. We have had some uh, challenges just in terms of safety and uh, weather and visibility with some of the uh, active areas. So uh, where if you know, something happens one day, we're not necessarily able to get in the next day uh, as much as we would like to kind of get our eyes on what might be happening out there. Uh, we, um, we do await um, kind of recommendation or, or permission, I suppose, from, from BC Wildfire, just in terms of how uh, safe it is to access it, if they will allow us to, uh, to enter in there to do that assessment or whom uh, we might be uh, kind of coordinating with to, to get that assessment done. Um, so it's obviously going to be very situation specific in terms of timing. Uh, so we thank everybody for, for their patience um, as uh, you know, the wildfires are, are continuing to remain active uh, throughout the region. 
Uh, the next question is um, somebody who has signed up from for Voyant Alert. So uh, Voyant Alert, uh, as you may have heard, is the emergency notification system that uh, the, here at the Thompson Nuclear Regional District, we are using this to send um, critical notifications to people uh, who are on evacuation order or on evacuation alert. Uh, so uh, just kind of a clarity around it. This person has asked, um, it worked great for one of their locations, but it hasn't sent them anything regarding their home location in Chase. Um, and then they had a, you know, an out of town friend uh, calling them about it. Uh, so, so what happened there? Um, I, can, I can explain what, what they're kind of uh, seeing is um, two, uh, two separate um, uh, two separate local governments. So uh, the village of Chase um, is, its, uh, is a member municipality uh, within the Thompson Nicola Regional District. Um, during an emergency, our local governments within the TNRD uh, do activate their own emergency operations uh, centers, and then they use their channels to be informing uh, residents uh, of the, the threat uh, to property, uh, things like uh, reception centers that those people may be evacuating to. So at this time, Chase is not actually using the Voyant Alert notification system, um, and the TNRD is only sending out notifications to our remote and rural residents who are outside of the municipal area boundaries. Uh, that is who we uh, are, are out here um, uh, protecting and alerting during uh, an emergency like these wildfires. So uh, this is going to be changing uh, certainly for a variety of municipalities. We have 10, 11 member municipalities within the region. Some of them are on buoyant alert. Um, so I'll just kind of give a little bit of a list of, of the updated um, uh, alerts you can expect to receive through the buoyant alert system uh, at this time. So the city of Kamloops uh, quite recently uh, has uh, joined on to using buoyant alert to send out notifications to residents. They had recently uh, done that uh, uh, just in these last few days um, due to uh, the White Rock Lake wildfire threat. Um, Logan Lake uh, is another one of our municipalities that is uh, using it to send out alerts. Uh, Sun Peaks Resort Municipality, uh, has also joined on to use it for sending alerts. Uh, Lytton came on recently uh, as uh, they go through the recovery process in the village of Lytton. Um, they are um, uh, using the system. So uh, depending on how they like to use it, they might be sending out uh, uh, informational notices to people uh, who are uh, up, up into the area um, or, or to let them know uh, resources and services that they can access, that sort of thing. Um, Merit, City of Merit uh, recently came on as well. So um, anyone who is looking to receive uh, these alerts through Buoyant Alert and um, maybe hasn't been getting them from uh, the Thompson Nicola Regional District and you might be in one of these uh, municipalities, you will be able to get those notifications now uh, from, your, from your local authority. Uh, a few of our areas um, have also signed up previous to this wildfire season. So uh, Ashcroft, um, they're using it quite extensively for a lot of day-to-day -day notifications. Uh, Cash Creek as well. Uh, to Kemloops to Shkwetmik, uh, also uh, has been using it and have their own account set up. Uh, a few of our areas aren't using it quite yet. Chase, as the previous um, uh, question came in from uh, is one of those municipalities. So that's where they might have seen an alert for something that would have been outside of the boundaries of Chase, um, but not one for inside the boundary. Um, Clinton uh, also has not yet signed up, nor has Clearwater or Barrier. Um, so that basically covers um, much of the Thompson Nicola Regional District. It is a little bit of a, you know, I, I understand that it can be a little bit of a, a confusing thing to, to kind of keep it simple. Basically, the, the Thompson Nicola Regional District is using it as yet another channel to be informing people of, of what is happening. So um, we post all evacuation orders and alerts on our website. Uh, we, pub we post them on social media. We send out uh, press releases. 
And so everything that we are doing there is then kind of reflected in what we send out through Voyant Alerts. So it's, um, it's just yet another way for people to be able to receive uh, critical information on um, emergency events from the TNRD. Um, we don't really use it for, um, for other informational purposes, whereas our municipalities uh, may use it as more of a um, way to keep in touch with their residents. So I hope that answers some questions. If you do have any uh, questions around buoyant alert, uh, need assistance getting set up with it, um, aren't sure how to use it again, please call us at the EOC. We'd be happy to uh, walk you through it and get you set up on there if you'd like to be. You'll only receive notifications from us if you've registered. It's not something that you'll get from us uh, whether you've registered or not, uh, like the, say, federal alert notification system that you might be familiar with from the Government of Canada. This is only for people who have opted in. They say, hey, yep, I do want to hear from the TNRD. Um, please you know, send me notifications to my, uh, to my phone or my uh, cell phone uh, or to an app or a home phone. So uh, yeah, please give us a call if you have any questions about that at all. I think that actually answered two questions. We did receive another one regarding uh, buoyant alert um, and a notification. Um, and I think it was a very similar situation where, um, you know, we have wildfires crossing boundaries uh, all over the province right now and certainly within uh, the regional district and beyond. Um, so, you know, there could be people that live quite close together um, and they might be receiving different types of notifications in different ways. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of the uh, the emergency program and uh, the the local governments that are responding to it. Okay, next question. Uh, I think this is our last one before I can take you in and give a bit of an update on uh, alerts and orders in the region. So uh, this is regarding a a permit, an access permit. Um, so for for those of you who have been uh, placed uh, on evacuation order, um, especially just recently, we received uh, quite a lot of requests from individuals um, to be able to um, access uh, their properties uh, to return, sorry, I lost my notes there, to return back into the area if they have uh, livestock that they need to feed or water or pets that they've left behind um, and would like to go and collect. Um, there was a bit of a window for some properties out near the uh, White Rock Lake wildfire area on order that uh, were um, allowed on recommendation of, of BC wildfire uh, sort of back in for a variety of areas, including uh, areas within the, the Thompson Nicola region. So uh, this question uh, says they, um, uh, they were, um, how can evacuee get the permit required to go inside the evacuation area? Um, I got a run around on the phone. Uh, and website didn't work. It was evacuated with no notice while at work. Um, so it doesn't say where this uh, resident uh, lives. Um, so first of all, I just want to uh, say it's it's going to be um, certainly dependent on whether uh, whether we are allowing uh, people to to go back into an evacuation order area. Uh, generally speaking, when there is an evacuation order issued, um, you must leave the area and you are not allowed to return until the evacuation order is lifted or rescinded back down to an evacuation alert. Um, however, as I mentioned, there, there has been a bit of a window of opportunity for some of those people uh, evacuated due to the White Rock Lake wildfire. So the first thing uh, is to give us a call. Um, we did experience a very, very high volume of calls about this, and uh, we uh, spent all day and evening and into the night yesterday returning phone calls to people uh, to ensure that we were uh, getting back to them, although there was certainly a, a bit of a time lapse or a delay before people might have heard from us. Um, it was just a, a quite a significant increase of, of calls with a very limited few uh, members operating out of our EOC that were able to uh, to get back to people, get all of the information required um, to issue the permit. Um, in addition to that, I did have a note that the permitting process, and I think that's the note that I uh, don't have in front of me here, but the general uh, conversations we've had with Emergency Management BC, BC Wildfire, and our other coordinating uh, 
uh, local governments and First Nations is that the permit process is changing a little bit. Um, so um, while we were we were able to sort of receive calls and requests for a permit and issue them um, same day, whether they be uh, you know later in the day than than one might have wanted, um, the process is going to change where people should expect to maybe give us a call and request a permit, um, but the permit access um, may not be granted until the next day. Um, so. If you do have any questions, of, of course, this is going to vary depending on the situation, safety and allowance uh, into an area. Um, but that's kind of a general idea around um, what, that, what that looks like for the permitting process. And basically uh, the best thing to do is to give us a call or your local government uh, if you are outside of the regional district um, to, to request that. And I think that is all the questions we have from our public submissions on our website. Um, so to finish things off today, I will just uh, uh, share a few updates and then share the website um, emergency uh, evacuation dashboard to, to finish off the meeting. Uh, so one quick note I wanted to mention is that the TNRD's Resiliency Center uh, is going on the road this week. Uh, it will be traveling to locations in the province where evacuees are located. Uh, so currently we have a resiliency center that's been activated that is in Kamloops itself. Um, they're going to be taking it on the road as a mobile resiliency center and it will be in Merritt on August 12th. It'll be there all day from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the Best Western. It'll then be continuing down the road uh, and we'll set up in Abbotsford from August 13th to 14th at the Clarion Hotel and Conference Center, uh, again from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. For the Mobile Resiliency Center, the Red Cross and Service BC will be in attendance. Pardon me. Um, so the Resiliency Center, if you are, are kind of curious about it, it's, a, it's an essential service for those who have been evacuated from their properties. Uh, it provides essential resources uh, such as insurance advice, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people will have questions about uh, for both vehicle and property. Uh, other information services for, for people who are wondering what, what might happen next for them and also coordinates with a number of non-governmental agencies. Um, so if you, uh, we will be publishing a press release on this with a little bit more information. So uh, again, you can find that on our website and social media channels. Um, and then kind of in line with that, uh, back to our website, we do have another page for uh, returning residents. So for those people who have been evacuated and uh, an order is lifted and they're on alert or it's been lifted to all clear and they're, they're heading back home. Uh, we do have a page for returning residents uh, that can be found on our website. Um, and it has uh, a lot of very valuable information. Um, again, some of it is re regarding the Resiliency Center if you did want to get in contact uh, with them at all. Um, it also has um, uh, information on um, uh, things like how to uh, deal with, you know, a fridge or, or a freezer that has been uh, uh, unplugged for, for a period of time where to drop it off or if there's a pickup service that might be happening for that in your area. Um, we have specific links um, around that for different areas as the, um, the process and the um, locations of uh, waste facilities are, are different. So each time there might be um, uh, an area of residents returning home, we'll update that. So right now you can find information around the Lydon area, uh, anyone in the Sparks Lake wildfire area and uh, Spences Bridge area for, for waste disposal information. Uh, you'll find information on kind of preparing before you go back, uh, things about water and sewer, um, more insurance information there, what to do after a fire, re-entering your home, uh, propane safety, and responding to stressful events, uh, taking care of ourselves, our families, and our communities. So uh, important information if people are wondering or, or, or thinking about what that next uh, step might, might be like uh, when they go back home. Um, so I'm just going to do a, a, a screen share of the evacuation status dashboard. Uh, we'll wrap up the meeting in about five minutes. So I'll just kind of share that with you uh, to finish off the, 
today's meeting. Uh, we do hold these every few days. Um, uh, the last one uh, was actually just recently uploaded to our YouTube channel. So apologies, there was a bit of a delay on that. We have had a few technical uh, challenges lately uh, with um, our website a, a few nights ago. We had uh, quite a flood of traffic, which uh, rendered it uh, offline for a short period of time. It's back up, everything is working fine. Um, and same with even point alert, we had a, we just had a, kind of a number of, uh, uh, of, of notices going out on there. So uh, we thank everyone for their patience. There's quite a lot of activity happening all the time um, here uh, within the regional district, uh, just in response to all of the wildfires. Um, and uh, yeah, we know it's a, we know it's quite a lot of information for the public. So um, I'm just going to share my screen here so we can have a look and, uh, Get a bit of an overview on the regional district. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen here um, and it shows a map of the Thompson Nicola Regional District as outlined in black. Uh, you'll also see some overlapping areas into uh, the Northeast, South and West. Um, so I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. Um, as you can see, uh, there is still quite a lot of orange and red. What that is indicating is orange areas are areas that are under evacuation alert status. Red are under evacuation order. There are a couple of green uh, areas on here that you can see today, uh, which is uh, uh, relatively new within the last 24 hours or so, we have been able to uh, rescind or lift an evacuation alert in those green areas to all clear status, which means there is no longer a threat uh, due to wildfire for properties that are within the boundaries there. Uh, however, as you can see, um, the number of uh, evacuation orders and alerts is still quite significant. And as we heard from BC wildfire, um, the fires of note and all of the fire activity uh, within the Thompson Nicola region and Kamloops Fire Center um, is, is, is still uh, ongoing. Um, they are still, uh, you know, actively working on, on guards and suppression of, uh, the, you know, certainly the largest fires uh, in the area. And um, perhaps the most significant as of recently has been the White Rock Lake fire, uh, which you can see here. <laughs> I'm just going to zoom in a tiny bit so we can see the extent of um, the fire kind of has a more uh, squiggly boundary. We would have seen um, a bit more of the um, up-to-date um, border when uh, Forest Towers was sharing his update with us earlier, but uh, <clears throat> this is giving you um, kind of the extent of the evacuation alerts and orders that have been uh, triggered due to this wildfire. Um, and it's still quite significant. However, even that has changed within the last uh, 12 to 24 hours uh, with some of the alerts in, um, for example, the city of Kamloops being able to be lifted, um, but still a number of them remaining in place here uh, in the Thompson Nicola region, right across the border into our neighboring regional districts and other communities. Um, into the Okanagan. So we're certainly uh, all keeping a close eye on, on that uh, as it moves and uh, hearing of any other recommendations that might be coming in for residents uh, within the TNRD uh, regarding safety um, or threat uh, from that fire. Um, the, um, the active evacuation orders, as you can see, there's it's showing 22 and that, that, that equates to uh, over a thousand um, addresses that are impacted. So showing approximately 1,203 addresses that are actually impacted uh, by an evacuation order just within the TNRD. Um, and those under evacuation alert, uh, those 48 active, which is basically a separate evacuation alert um, is uh, covering about 4,003, over 4,000 properties uh, still under evacuation alert. Uh, so, you know, um, we're still looking at a total of uh, about 23% of the entire Thompson Nicola Regional District uh, that is impacted by evacuation order, evacuation alert, 
or state of local emergency for an electoral area. Um, so, uh, you know, while we certainly uh, we're hoping to see some uh, some significant rain or, or shift in weather, uh, we we understand that some uh, some more hot sunny weather is is on the way. So. Um, Please keep in touch with our website. Um, if you're ever wondering if you are in an area that's on evacuation or evacuation, or sorry, evacuation order or alert, uh, you can use the search function. This is the public evacuation status dashboard. You will find it on our website as well as shared on our social media channels. I believe we have a post pinned on both social pages um, sharing a link to this. Uh, there's a little search function. Uh, you may be able to see my, my mouse here at the top right where you can type in your address or a location um, and you can type it in and it will bring it up. You can zoom to it and it'll share uh, whether that is uh, a property that is showing that it's under evacuation order or alert because there are so many um, bordering orders and alerts. They're quite, you know, they're, they're next to each other. Um, you know, it, you, you might be unsure. You might have heard from somebody near you. Uh, where there has been a change and uh, an alert might have been lifted uh, or an order might have been rescinded down to an alert. Um, my best recommendation is to give us a call if you're not sure if that impacts you or not, uh, or if you want to kind of uh, check it out yourself, um, come here to our website and check out the uh, public evacuation status dashboard. Uh, it'll really help to clear things up. This is updated in real time as we are actually issuing uh, changes or new uh, orders and alerts in the area. So, um, and in addition, the uh, fire symbols you see here uh, indicating the, the fires, um, wildfires of note and, and other fires within our Kamloops Fire Center and beyond are, are brought in from the BC wildfire status or, or to the BC wildfires dashboard. Um, so, the squiggly line, as I mentioned earlier, um, will also change and update based on the data that comes in from BC Wildfire. So uh, it's a really uh, helpful resource, uh, certainly for this year, um, with, with all of the activity going on to be able to come and check this out. And, and uh, if you have family or friends that are wondering, and you can help them by, by looking at this, uh, Please feel free to, to use it um, and uh, give us a call if you're if you're wanting to, and we'll we'll kind of look at uh, look at your address for you, and we can help to identify whether it's um, under an order or alert or not. Um, and uh, for road closures, I think that's another important thing that I'll just kind of finish off with today. There's been a number of, of highways and roads that have been impacted uh, due to wildfires. Um, you can kind of see on our website, we've also got some dark blue lines uh, that I just clicked on one of them and it's bringing in information from Drive BC. Uh, so while we do have some of this on our website, you'll see now that I've mentioned it, uh, quite a lot of dark blue bold lines that are uh, running throughout the region. Uh, this is information right from Drive BC. So if you're kind of wondering what the status is, uh, if you're looking to take a route uh, in and through the regional district, um, please check Drive BC for the latest. They'll often have uh, a time when they will be updating the status next. Um, uh, and uh, if you are also potentially returning home from an area that was on evacuation order, um, there certainly could be some impacts on, on highways or, or roads around the route you might be taking home, uh, as is happening kind of throughout the prov province right now. So you can see this uh, again, this is on our public evacuation status uh, interactive map, or you can also visit Drive BC uh, directly for specific route information. So I'm going to leave it there uh, for the map as there is so much uh, so much on there right now. Um, and there's probably a lot of questions you, you may have specific to where you live um, um, that uh, I, I certainly encourage you to be checking it out, uh, following our social media uh, for the latest and uh, checking out our website. In addition, BC Wildfire uh, on their website um, uh, does post updates on wildfires of note uh, once or twice a day. Um, so if you're kind of wondering which direction the fire is going in, um, what structural protection is happening uh, out there, 
uh, in your in your area, um, what kind of um, um, equipment might be on scene fighting the fire. Um, you'll find that on BC Wildfires website, um, uh, where they kind of list through uh, what's happening on there uh, throughout the day and what they have planned to do in in the coming uh, coming 24 hours or so. So uh, very helpful if you're sort of thinking, hey, you know what, I haven't really heard um, anything that's happening uh, around me uh, lately. Um, that's a great place to start to sort of see if, uh, you know, perhaps the, the fire activity is, is kind of changing and, and kind of moving away. Um, and if that's the case, then, um, you know, we may expect to hear further recommendations from BC Wildfire if that's going to trigger a change to a status uh, for evacuation orders or alerts within, uh, within the TNRD. And I think that's uh, that's about everything on our agenda today to go over. So again, lots of information, lots of things going on, uh, uh, and it, it continues to to be that way um, for us. So um, again, uh, the TNRD Emergency uh, Operations Center is uh, fully activated uh, seven days a week, uh, from about 8:30 p.m. to 8 or sorry 8:30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, depending on uh, on the need. Sometimes it's later in the evening. Uh, sometimes it could be earlier uh, in the evening. But uh, if, if you're looking for information, please give us a call. Uh, always visit our, our website and social media for the latest. Um, and um, we, will, uh, we will have our next public information update within the next few days uh, or sooner if needed. Um, so please continue to submit your questions for these meetings on our website in advance so that we can answer them for you or have BC Wildfire or other agencies address them while they're here with us. So that's all for today and thank you very much for joining us. Um, we, uh, we hope everyone is staying safe out there and um, we will see you at the next update meeting. Take care and be safe. <laughs>